morning. Welcome to Independent Methodist Church. Today is Sunday, October 4th, 2020. It is also Worldwide Communion Sunday. Every congregation on the planet will be observing the Lord's Supper, and we will at Independent Methodist. The guest preacher today is the Reverend Matthew Bupp, husband, father, hospice chaplain, pastor of the Elwood City Christian Assembly, and coach of the Shenango cross country team. Many of you know Matthew, the son of the late Dennis Bupp, chaplain of Jamison Hospital. Participating in the service, video photographer Shane Donnelly, and the lector is Michelle Prizer. Music is by Michelle Burns, the Saturday organist, and harpist Jingy Jang. A letter will go out to the congregation on Monday. The children of the congregation are reminded there is a memorization contest. They have been challenged to commit to memorization the 23rd Psalm, the Lord's Prayer, the books of the Bible, or the Apostles' Creed. The prayer shawl ministry will restart this Thursday on the 8th. It is good that you are with us. morning. Glad you're here. We have been looking at foods that we find in our grocery stores that have a Christian message. And the food that we're looking at today is the apple. At the very beginning of our Bible, there is the story of Adam and Eve. The very first man who ever lived, his name was Adam. And he had a wife, and her name Eve. And God established through them creation and the human family. And they lived in a beautiful garden. And God told them that they could eat all the bananas they wanted, all the oranges and the pineapples and cherries. And, but there was one tree that they were forbidden to touch. Now the Bible says it is a fruit tree we do not know what the fruit was, but it belonged to God. And God told them they were not to eat it. Well, a big snake came to Adam and Eve 
and the devil was talking through the snake, kind of like a puppet, and told them, why don't you just go ahead and eat that, eat that fruit? All right, so Eve ate it, then she went to her husband and he ate it. Now, many people think that the fruit that Adam and Eve ate was an apple, right? That's, that's the common belief. And if you look at this depiction, you see the serpent with Adam and Eve and a tree covered with apples. Now this is the popular understanding, it's not in the Bible, that when Eve ate, she took one bite, she swallowed her piece of the apple. That Adam, he took a bite as well, and an angel flew over and stopped him from swallowing, and that is why we have an indention at the base of our neck that the angel pressed his thumb into the neck of Adam and Adam's got lodged. Now you can go, a boy does not have this, but when a boy becomes a man, he has a protrusion in his neck. You can check out your father and your grandfather and this is called an Adam's apple and that the idea Again, it's not in the Bible, but it's based upon something that happened in the Bible, that it was to be a permanent reminder to us that Adam and Eve, our great-great-grandfather, disobeyed God. And that all the problems that have come into the world have just snowballed over the centuries. Okay? So, Adam's apple. Now, where do we go with this? Well, when you take the apple, God used this fruit to send a message, to give us hope. And when you take an apple and you cut it in half, every apple has this. What do you find? A star. And also, you will find five seeds. Every apple, every apple has a star and it has five seeds, as you see in this illustration. Now, God was giving hope to all the world. The star symbolizes the star of Bethlehem and that God promised that he was going to send someone into the world who could help correct things and start turning things around. The things would go better on earth. And of course, we understand the apple with the star reminds us of the birth of Jesus and that the wise men traveled to worship the one who was born to be our savior. And then the five seeds, the five seeds in the star remind us of Jesus suffering on the death on the cross, the Jesus wounds on his hands, his feet, and his side. And of course, the star of Bethlehem, Jesus was born at Christmas, and the five wounds, the five seeds, Good Friday and Easter, that God gave, gave all of us hope. Now when Adam ate the fruit, he didn't want to be responsible. God said, why did you do that? And he didn't want to take the blame. He said, Eve, she, she's the one that told me to do it. And God said to Eve, well, why did you do it? And she blamed the snake. All right, so people don't want to owe up to the things they do. They try to blame other people. But the story here is that when we confess to God, and we tell him we're sorry. God gives us hope, and our hope is in Jesus. And when we look at the apple with the star and with the five seeds, that God in the future was going to do something, and he did through his son Jesus coming into the world. So every time we eat an apple, it's a reminder to us of the sin that came into the world 
but also the forgiveness and the hope that we have in Jesus. And if you were in church this weekend, I was going to give you a Christmas ornament of an apple with seeds. I hope you're having a good day. We'll see you next weekend. The Word of God is found in the second book of Kings, chapter 23, verses 21 through 27. I'm reading from the New International Version. King Josiah renews the covenant. The king gave his order to all the people. Celebrate the Passover to the Lord your God as it is written in this book of the covenant. Not since the days of the judges who led Israel, nor throughout the days of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah had any such Passover been observed. But in the 18th year of King Josiah, this Passover was celebrated to the Lord in Jerusalem. Furthermore, Josiah got rid of the mediums and the spiritists, the household gods, the idols, and all the other detestable things in the Judah and Jerusalem. Then he did to fulfill the requirements of the law written in the book of Helkiah, the priest had discovered in the temple of the Lord. Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did, with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his strength, in accordance with all the law of Moses. Nevertheless, the Lord did not turn away from the heat of, this, of his fierce anger, which burned against Judah because of all that Manasseh had done to provoke him to anger. So the Lord said, I will remove Judah also from my presence as I removed Israel, and I will reject Jerusalem, the city I chose, and this temple about which I said, There shall my name be. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. It is a privilege to be with you here this morning and to share uh, the message that I've entitled, The Courage to Change, as we reflect upon the life of Josiah. As a matter of fact, as the scriptures record, he was the greatest king in the Old Testament. Uh, there was none that was like him beforehand, and there was none like him afterward. But he followed the Lord, his God, and he loved him with all of his heart, with all of his strength. And as we share in this message, I want to challenge all of us to understand and rest in the fact that God has a higher call for all of us in the midst of our lives and the challenges that we're facing as a country, in our communities, uh, the challenging times that we face are all resolved by one issue. It's a call to repentance. It's a call to holiness. A separation from the world standards and the covenants that the world makes with evil. And return to a covenant, a covenant of change, a covenant that promises us uh, the will of God and the purpose of why we're on this earth, which is to be a light, which is to be life uh, to the world that is in darkness. And so Josiah, in his life, as a very young man, eight years old, he became king. He served for 31 years. And unlike his grandfather, Manasseh, who served for 55 years, he turned to God with all of his heart. And in order to turn to God with all of your heart, what you have to do is you have to have a standard. And what had been lost uh, for generations was the standard of God's word. And there was a priest named Hilkiah that was uh, serving in the house of the Lord, and he uncovered uh, the book of the law. This law had been lost. It was the Torah. It was the word of, words of Moses. And when this uh, word was read to him, what Josiah did was the following. I'm going to share with you from chapter 22. Uh, Josiah, as this word was written, or excuse me, was uh, read to him, it says, Now it happened that when the king heard these words, the book of the law, he tore his clothes. And so he was in much grief, understanding and watching not only his father, Ammon, but also Manasseh and their leadership, which was uh, a leadership that was likened unto the nations around them. They served evil. And in the course of Josiah's uh, bringing back true worship, he began to deal with the very gods that they had made agreements with, some of gods which were the greatest of the pagan gods, one of which was Baal, which is a god of strength and fertility. You had the god of Astra, which was a goddess of fertility. 
Chemosh, which was the god of, we could consider him a god of war. Uh, uh, also, there was uh, other gods that he dealt with in his reign as, as king. And he brought reformation. But he returned to God based upon the standard that was raised. And in our lives, especially in context of our nation, and as we have lost, a lot like uh, Josiah was raised underneath a culture, and in a culture that had lost its way, uh, we as well, as I can look in decades past, we began in the 60s when we began to take prayer to schools and begin to distance us, our, distance ourselves from the God that we have been founded upon, our, our nation was founded upon. We too have, have been, uh, have begun to uh, come into very dark days. And we as the people of God, um, of we need to raise the standard and to really rediscover the law of God and understand the truth and the riches that are found there. Now, when Josiah found this book and it was read, uh, he rent his clothes. And what that is is a picture of rending self-righteousness. And in our lives, we think we know what we're doing. Uh, everybody in this world, we all have a standard that we try to attain we try to keep up appearances. We especially are good at that in church. One of the things that God does not like is he doesn't like pretense. He doesn't like a form of worship. He doesn't like a form of godliness. Because as uh, in the New Testament, in the epistle, it says that it denies the power thereof. We can have a form, but it doesn't have any power. There's no anointing. And so when Josiah came face to face with this law of Moses, his heart was rent. He did it in an outward way, but what he realized at that point that there needed to be changes. There needed to be a return. And in doing so, he began to deal with the gods of, uh, of, of the nations around them that they had likened themselves uh, and, uh, unto and to, had begun to worship. And these gods were also not only uh, existent then, but these gods are also existent in existence today. One of the other gods that they dealt with, he dealt with in this chapter uh, that we have uh, heard from this morning, was the god of Moloch, which was uh, the god of child sacrifice to fire and to war. And today we can see the reality of that, even in the likeness of abortion. We can see the, that these gods, the god of destruction, the god of fertility, lust, uh, uh, over -sexual, uh, sexualized culture, we see these in operation, though they're not named, but ultimately we have befriended them as a culture. As we have removed God, we have removed prayer. We've distanced ourselves from him. We've distanced, we've distanced ourselves from his word. And in doing so, we have opened ourselves up. We as human beings were created for subjugation. We were created to worship. And if you don't worship God, who is the true and living God, Yahweh, and his son, Jesus, you are subject to another form of worship. If you look at any culture throughout time and throughout the world today, every culture has a form of worship. It's because we were created to worship. We were given a spirit by which to connect and to relate with the supernatural realm. And God has given us our spirit in order to relate with him. And that spirit has been broken based upon sin and disobedience, taking us back to the garden. And so what the nation of Judah had fallen into was ultimately uh, something that was in accordance with human nature. But the reality is, is even though we as a nation have fallen in the same respect, we have fallen out of touch with God and out of fellowship, out of covenant with God, I believe that God is challenging us in this day to change. Uh, the courage that it takes to change it comes based upon being willing to take a stand. And that's what Josiah did. He, he revolted against the self-righteousness. Any level of worship that he had may, maybe grown up with, this double standard of keeping some form of worship to God and yet worshiping all of these other idol, idols, he began to take uh, uh, it to task. And he tore down all these idols in these places of high worship. And he began to ultimately usher the, the nation into a season of restoration, of healing. And it's interesting that Josiah's name is a Hebrew word that reflects Jehovah has healed. And Josiah led the nation into a time of healing. The nation at that time had, had, had 
you know, if, if you can think of it like this, uh, the, our, our flesh, physical body, if it's been rent, if it has been cut, and a gaping wound, it is open and susceptible for infection. And the nation at that time was, was a festering wound, if you will. It was full of all kinds of, of, uh, of vile, um, uh, terrible illness and, and infection, spiritually speaking. And what, what happened was that they considered that they accepted that as normal. I mean, they were, they were destroying, they were sacrificing their children in fire. They were worshiping, and there, there was all types of idol worship and, 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 and sexual type of idolatry even in, t in the temple and the things that were going on. And it was accepted as a norm, but it was, it was the people of, of God had grown uh, and, and filled with infection. Their, their worship was tainted. And Josiah saw this standard, and as the standard was raised, what he began to do is he began to address the infection. What does someone who have, has an infection, what do they do? They, they first begin to deal with what's there, and they begin to deal with the foreign objects, the things that might be there, cleansing it with saline solution or uh, giving, it a, uh, give, giving it a bath of saline solution and, and, and other types of antiseptic fluids. And then they begin to usher that, that wound into a season of healing. That's what Josiah began to do. He brought this return to God, this reform, and it brought them and ushered them into healing. And that's what we're in desperate need of in our country. We are sick and we are dying. And, uh, and ultimately God is, is wanting to bring us into that place of, of healing and restoration and wholeness. Uh, God's plan for us is, is never for us to stay the same, but his goal for us is to change. I've, I found out in, in, that in, in my life that, that change is, is synonymous with the covenant that God's called us to. And in the scripture, uh, it, and we're going to read here in just a little bit, that Josiah led them back to the covenant that God had originally had made with the people and with the leadership. And as we have heard read here this morning, uh, that uh, as the scriptures reflect, that Josiah kept these words and, and uh, of the book of law. And one of the things that are incorporated in the book of the law is the Old Testament feast or the holy days. And in the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 23, there are seven holy days and God said that they were his feasts. They were his days. And what they reflected were the days that he was going to intervene into the affairs of man. And we have the, the spring feast, which is the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and the feast of first fruits, which Jesus fulfilled dramatically on the days and within the week of, of the most holy week of the year, which is uh, the week of, uh, of the death, celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And 50 days after Passover, which in the Greek we have the word penta, we have Pentecost, we have the feast of, uh, of Shavuot. And the feast of Shavuot was uh, the, the barley harvest that came in. And it was the first harvest of the church on the day. They were gathered in the upper room and the Holy Spirit fell. And it fulfilled that feast that they had celebrated for centuries that God told them. It was a sign. It was a dress rehearsal for what God was going to do on that day. And he was going to bring in the first harvest of the church. Peter went and preached his first sermon. And thousands were added to the church that day. And there's three other feasts. And friends, we're right in the middle of the celebration of those three fall feasts. We had the feast of Rosh Hashanah, or the feast of trumpets that just came in a little over a week ago. This past Monday was the Yom Kippur. Day of Atonement, which where the priest would go into the Holy of Holies and make sacrifice. We know that as a reflection of what Jesus did for us. But then we have beginning, uh, beginning today would be the second day, but yesterday, Saturday, would have been the first day of what they call uh, the Feast of Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles, which celebrates the years that God took care of the nation of Israel while they wandered in the desert for four years. But those three fall feasts all center around what Christ is going to do in his return. He's going to come back at the last trump. The trumpet will sound. He is going to make atonement for his people, the Day of Atonement, 144,000. And we are going to eternally tabernacle with our God in a new heaven and a new earth. And it, it, we don't know how it's all going to unfold. But the exciting thing is, is these are three days that have not yet been fulfilled by God as they're his days to intervene in the affairs of man. So we look forward to that. Now I share those things with you for a reason. 
my parents, um, Dennis and Joy Buck. I can remember my dad, and because what, what happened with Josiah is that he led the people into returning to God, into that reform. He led them into a season of healing, and it brought a revival that the nation had never known. And I believe that we are right for revival. And friends, if you remember in the reading, God still did not relent to destroy Judah and Jerusalem where his name was at. And I don't believe that this nation is going to be saved and intact. And I don't believe this revival that's coming is not to somehow save the nation from failing. Because I think we're already long down that road. Judah was already long down that road. It was nothing going to stop that. But what God was doing this for was he was setting up what was going to survive that second invasion, that Babylonian invasion that was going to come in. He was setting up the remnant. The people of God, as the Bible says, the remnant were the people who did not bow their knee to Baal. Now it's interesting what Baal is. Baal worship, Baalzebub in the New Testament Greek, it's Beelzebub. We know it as Satan. It was literally occultic Satan worship. All of the worship that he was coming against was actually the hand of Satan and demonic activity. And God is calling us to come to a place of healing and being restored. Jesus said, I've come to set the captive free, to heal the broken heart, to give recovery of sight to the blind. In doing this, what he does is he restores us to who we really are, our spirit, but also our soul. The scripture says that the, the possess your soul, your salvation, work it out with, with fear and trembling. Because God wants to, to make us whole because he, he wants to use us. When everything in this world has fallen apart, he wants to use us as light. And that's what the remnant was. The remnant was carried off after the Babylonian invasion. Assyria destroyed Israel in the north. Uh, Babylon came in and destroyed Judah in the south. But there was a remnant that was taken off. And we have the great stories of Daniel. The great story of, of Esther. That all took place in the Babylonian captivity. There were people who didn't bow their knee to the veil. And they actually uh, allowed the nation to continue because ultimately it came back if you read the story of Nehemiah and he came back and he reinstituted as a lot like what Josiah did they read the book of the law they lamented and they restored their hearts into that covenant again God wants us to live a life of change live a life of of covenant by living a life of restoration wholeness and keeping our uh, the law of God in front of us now I, I begin to share about my parents my dad saw this revival. He preached for revival for decades. I grew up listening to him preach revival. After he left Fort Lauderdale, Florida, with a thriving church, God told him to come to Newcastle, and his message was revival. He left everything. I, I remember we lived, now, not to say anything against him, but we lived literally as paupers for, 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 for years. It was, it, it, and he worked, and he began to uh, till the soil and to invest the seed into this community. And he would preach revival, revival, revival. And I can remember a message that he gave one time. He, saw, he said that the, the, the main component of the, of the revival that's going to take place is a lot like what happened to Josiah. Remember the portion that was read this morning, that there was never a Passover that was celebrated like this one before or after. Boy, I would have liked to have been a part of that celebration. But I believe it was meaningful because of the change in the covenant that was so fresh. So fresh. As a matter of fact, every New Year, every New Year where we, where we began the, the, the celebration of these feasts, it's all drawn off of Exodus 12, where God gave Moses and Aaron, he literally gave them the, the calendar. And he said, from this day, you'll count 10 days and you'll bring in a lamb. And on the 14th day, you'll slay that lamb. Every year in the Jewish tradition, the ecclesiastical year, in the Jewish tradition, it all begins with Passover. It's a reflection. It's, it's a really a time of new beginnings. We think we have it when we celebrate January 1st to make New Year's resolutions. But boy, wouldn't it be better if we celebrated it when God gave it to us? And I believe in what he spoke, I remember in the service, is that he believed that a revival was coming as when, when people began to, like Josiah did, he got back to the law. And he realized these are God's days. These aren't man's days. We've forgotten about them. Lord, forgive us for forgetting about your days. And let us celebrate those days. Let us discipline ourselves to reflect upon how you've intervened in history, but look forward to the coming of our Lord. And we, as I shared, we are living this week, this past week, and today, Sunday, the second day of the celebration, uh, this last holy day, uh, seventh holiday of the year for the Jewish Hebrew people 
is uh, it lasts for eight days. We're in the second day of Sukkot. Um, but he believed that revival was coming when, because it would be something that unifies the church. Did you know that George Barna, a few years ago, they, 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 in studying the, the church denominations, they believe that there's over 80,000 denominations in the Christian, Christian 80,000. I, I can't even wrap my head around that. But the schisms and the separations and the break-offs and the splits, they, I, I can't imagine being a part of that team to try to figure that out. But, but it speaks volumes that far more divides us than unites us. We say Christ unites us, and if God does and Christ unites us, I think that we, like Josiah, we need to get back to the reality of, of what he told us to celebrate. Now, I'm encouraging you to do that. I hope that maybe you have a little hunger maybe to get back. That's just a portion of the message that I'm sharing with you this morning. But I want you to have the courage to change because we're facing darkness in our culture around us. And I don't believe that the, cult, I don't believe the culture and our, our American experiment, if you will, is going to be saved necessarily. Because I don't know if it's, I think we might be past a certain point. But I believe that God is setting up and restoring us to be a remnant that is going to survive no matter what happens. They say that democracies don't, democracies don't last very long. Two to three centuries. And we're doing, we're doing pretty good. We've lasted this long. But you can see the changes that are happening. Uh, things, things are growing vastly out of control, out of line, even with way, the way the framers have originally intended our nation to be governed. And so you can see the changes. And I don't, I don't see necessarily a way back, but I do and always will see, and I will encourage you, that there's always a way back to God. It's repentance. It's turning. It's, it's a rending of our self-righteousness, what we think we're doing right, to accept the reality and the wholeness of what God has in store for us as a people, which is wholeness, that our spirit would be renewed daily by the blood of the Lamb, and that our souls would be renewed and restored on a daily basis. We shouldn't be the same person 10 years from now, okay, than we are, as we are today. I grew up in a church and I saw a lot of people that were in a church for decades. They'd say they were Christians for 50 years, but I tell you, I, I didn't, couldn't, as a young man and watching them, couldn't chart much change in their life. And, and, and I think that it's because we're, we're guilty of the status quo. Human nature is, um, I, you know, I'm satisfied. And, and I think as Josiah uh, broke the curse of his grandfather, Manasseh, he, he, he broke it and, and he gave us such a powerful example in the Old Testament of how to find healing, how to find restoration for a nation. Not necessarily that God's going to save the nation. And I don't want to speak that in a sense. My prayer is that God would save and keep us intact. But judging history and understanding even governments and the way they operate, nations rise and fall. Um, if God didn't save his own nation, but he kept the remnant, may we be a part of that remnant. In closing, I wanted to, to share with you the beginning of chapter 23 that we received from here this morning. And it's when he restored true worship in, in, in with the people. And in reading this, I'm encouraging all of us to, uh, to draw near to God together as a people and receive this covenant of change. And before I share this with you, in the, in the Old Testament, there is a, a very special uh, word that goes along with celebrating the covenant that God has given to us. And it was found in every aspect of worship. It's in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, In every oblation of thy meat offering, all the offerings, thou shalt uh, season with salt, neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God and be lacking from the meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Salt was, it is actually called the salt of the covenant. It's so interesting what salt does. Salt is like the Word of God. What it begins to do, it, it preserves. That's what the Word of God does. It preserves us. It keeps us intact. It, it promotes healing. It's kind of an antiseptic. It does all kinds. In your human body, you couldn't have the right blood pressure without salt. In our, in our world, without salt in the oceans, you couldn't have life. If you took all the salt out of the oceans, it would kill off all the algae in the oceans, and we would lose over half. We would lose 50% of our photosynthesis, and we would... We would it would, be a, it would be a death threat to the whole world. The world would begin to die. Salt is so important, and God refers to this. And so I want to encourage you to remember this covenant that they're making. It's a salt covenant. It's a reflection. It's a, it's a word of God covenant. It's agreeing to be humble. It's agreeing as, as Joshua was, he was, excuse me, Josiah was humble. 
He was willing to be told what to do. He was willing to be wrong. One of the most powerful words that invoke humility, humility is the Hebrew word, which is shaka. And it's, he was willing not to have a word to say on his defense, just like Jesus did when he was led to the cross. That's what humility is. He didn't make any excuses with what he heard. He didn't say, oh, you know what, I'll do this and I'll do that. He made sweeping reforms and changes. And it began with his own life and dealing with his own self-righteousness and anything that was there. So let me read this and may we all commit ourselves to this covenant that God would grant us the courage to change and be the, be the light and as Jesus said, the salt of the earth, that we would not lose our saltiness. That, uh, saltiness, can it really lose its saltiness? I've heard it said that Jesus said that when he said, don't let it lose its saltiness. It was more in the lines of, let it be pure salt. Don't let it be um, combined with anything else. Because I don't know about you, I wouldn't put salt on my food if it had dirt in it, if it was combined with something else. But be pure, be separate, be holy. And the king sent them to gather all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem to him. The king went up to the house of the Lord with all of the men of Judah and with him all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant, which had been found in the house of the Lord. Not just the book of the law, but the covenant, the salt, the very thing that brings life, that protects, that preserves, that makes life possible. Then the king stood by a pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to follow the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart, with all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people took a stand for the covenant. May we all join Josiah. As millennia ago, he made this commitment for the covenant. May we make a commitment to the covenant. If you remember in the New Testament, Jesus gave us one law that summed up all the law and the prophets. Mark chapter 12, verse 30 and 31, he said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Same words. It's the gift of the covenant, our commitment to God, that we swear to our own hurt, that we die to ourselves, that we find a solution for our social ills today, not in everybody else changing, not in this nation getting back on its feet and being what we believe it can be, but rather for the people who have the truth to live by the truth, to remember the law of God, what God's taught, and to celebrate that and to make a, a, an eternal daily commitment to the best of what God has in store for us. Would you join your hearts with me? Father, I thank you, Lord, for this word. I thank you for the salt of the covenant. I thank you today that you're all across, Lord, those, uh, this, this place and those that are listening, that you're giving us all the courage to change, that you right now, Lord, are, are touching us by your spirit, reminding us, Lord, of the changes we need to make. And even in the days and the weeks to come, I pray that we would tear down the idolatry, Lord, the self-righteousness, and may we, Lord, dig into your word, May we continue, Lord, to stand with Josiah and with the saints of old and the patriarchs that stood, that were great men, not because of what they did, but because of their faith, their decrease, their humility, and help us to be the same. So we commit our hearts to you this day. Bless us, Lord, we ask, as we bless you with our best. We pray through Christ our Lord, we ask these things. Amen.